last year, so that might have pushed back your growing time. I know it pushed back the growing time on my tomatoes. Jeremy, this is my husband. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, David. Oh, thank you. I still can't get my printer to print, so I'm probably going to be sending you some stuff. Um, okay. I get off in 30 minutes. Oh, shit. Sorry. Sorry. Enjoy your weekend. <laughs> I love you. Thank you. Sorry. Did you get something? Okay. Love you. Lil Mood is now joining. David Mood. Hey, Lil. Hey, how are you this morning? I'm doing fine, doing fine. <laughs> how about you? I, I'm fine. I was. I keep looking <laughs> at this thing that tells us about this Teams meeting, and I'm thinking. <laughs> Is that is that a way for us to do this and see each other too? Do you know anything about that? Yes, ma'am. That's that's exactly what it is. So what so what do we have to do to do that? Are y'all doing that? Two participants no, are now joining. Not a lot of people do it. Um, but you click, you just click on the link, and it's going to pull up a page, and it'll have a little um, prompt up top. Um, and Jeremy, you just cancel that out and say do in your browser, right? And when you do it in your browser, it'll open up everybody, and you can see everybody that's actually on the call. Okay, but right now we don't know anybody who's doing that on the call. Is that right? Is that what right you're now, saying? Right now, primarily, it's just the comment staff. Okay, okay. Well, because, uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm doing a lot of Zoom meetings with other groups of people, yeah. and I thought it does, it is kind of um, nice to see each other's faces. Absolutely, you know, absolutely. You know, you, know, you know what, Larry? Larry. Is you know, now joining. Hey, you, you know why? You, you know why a lot of people, lots of people, won't go to homecoming games for that college. Don't do the what? I say lots, lots of people will not go to homecoming uh, for, for that for that college, the alumni homecoming. Yeah, yeah. Because they don't want people to see them. So you know darn well I'm not gonna press this button this morning. I don't want anybody to see me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it do, it does require me to brush my hair and that kind of thing. It, I mean, there's a big demand. <laughs> Maybe not be in my pajamas at noon. <laughs> uh, okay, who all we got? We have we have we have a team. I am. I'm going to run and see if I can locate John. Hold, hold one second, okay, guys. And okay. I, I John's on the line. Oh, hey, John. Okay, John's John. on the line. And I haven't heard Derek's voice. Is he with us? Derek yeah. is here. Derek, Derek is here. Mm-hmm. Great. Okay. Okay. We in place. Yeah. We ready to rock and roll. Good. See you later. How are you, John? That's, yeah, I'm here. Okay, John is there. Okay. Everybody's here? <clears throat> um, Everybody's here. Okay, at this time, I'm going to call it meeting to order. No. Um, Madam Secretary, do we have a quorum? Yes, sir, we do. Okay. Uh, I'm going to call the roll. Uh, Derek Huggins. Derek? Derek's here. Okay. Lil Moon? Here. And Roger Leakes. We are, these, we are the three. So that's the quorum right there. Thank you very much. At this time, I, I'm asking for a uh, motion to adopt the agenda. I so move. Second. Probably moved and second. Agenda adopted. Uh, item number three, adoption of the minutes from the May 15, 2020 meeting. And that can be found on pages two through four. Can I get a motion? So moved. Can I get a 
Get a second? I, I second it. Okay, thank you. I promptly moved and second. I, I, I apologize, Colonel Lee. Two with that, I heard Huggins and then me, uh, right? Huggins motion. And John and Ando. Okay. Is now exiting. Okay, uh, John is exiting. John is exiting? I'm here. I'm here. I just, I just walked oh. in the room. Oh, okay, okay. All right. <laughs> Item number four on the agenda. Uh, I don't think uh, this is uh, item number four on the agenda. Uh, 4A, we'll take 4A, which is on page, can be found on page four, uh, five, and six uh, of, the, uh, of the agenda. Update of the Comet Operations, Vehicle Cleaning, Food Delivery, uh, and, and, and Reopening. Uh, who want to take the lead on that? You want to take the lead on that, John? Yes, I'll, I'll turn it over to Larry to give an update on transit operations. Okay. okay. All right. Go ahead, John. I mean, Larry. Yes, sir. Um, so we started the enhanced Saturday service on Wednesday, May 20th. Uh, um, it's going good. Uh, we're still keeping track of the full buses, and, and uh, we're still getting a fair number of them. Uh, the 21st. We got 17 full buses. On the first day of it, we had uh, uh, eight full buses. Uh, today, we were, we're already up to about eight. I'll see you a little later. So I'll see you a little we're, later. We're, the ridership is What time you get up? Hold a minute. We can't, we, we can't, we can't hear you. I was going to work tonight, but I got to get the baby. But I'll be here all day tomorrow, and I'm here coming. Excuse me. We need to. We need to, persons not not talking. Need to put the phone on mute or something because we're getting too much background noise. Can you hear a little better now? Okay. Thank you for those persons who've done that. Okay, Larry. We use. We you yes, say sir? again what you. Okay, please. Have no problem. So, um, we like I said, we started the enhanced Saturday service that started on Sat um, Wednesday, May twentieth, and uh, it's going well. Uh, we brought back. Um, operators with the increased service, uh, we uh, uh, we increased uh, uh, several of the routes, six routes, I believe, uh, um, from one hour headway to 30 minute service, and uh, to uh, meet the needs of the ridership. But we're still seeing full buses, so that's just telling us that that uh, increasing that that headway w was absolutely necessary. And uh, we're still getting, like I said, we're still getting reports of full buses on those routes. So we're going to continue to track that, and we'll we'll go over that daily on our four o'clock call, uh, so that we can um, Betty. Uh, we can, you know, uh, is now uh, joining and send extra buses if needed. Okay. The meal, the meal delivery ser service is going well. Uh, we're still only doing it four days a week. Um, next week, we're not going to be delivering on Monday because it's a holiday. But uh, like I said, that's going well. We're delivering about, I think it's 87 meals a week. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, with the cleanliness of the buses, uh, we are we have a supervisor that is out there every night. Uh, monitoring not only what the, the utility workers are doing on the buses, but then checking them afterwards and making note of things that need to be repaired, making note of things um, that uh, if something is, doesn't meet the level of uh, cleanliness for the contract, putting it back through the service line so that it um, can get remedied. Um, so that seems to be helping tremendously with that, that level of cert uh, supervision out there. Uh, last night, we, with all of the uh, service line personnel, uh, along with the consultant that TCS has, has brought to train his folks uh, to um, clean uh, in, a, in a more efficient way to make sure that we're getting these buses cleaned and disinfected as, as good as, as we need it to be for this, for this um, you know, with the COVID and, and, and not just that, but just getting the bus clean for our, our passengers, clean and disinfected. So he is training each one of those people 
Um, and uh, he's also uh, trained them how to use a fogger, which is a uh, machine that will uh, disinfect the bus after they've cleaned it. So uh, with all of those new things that we're doing with the service line, we expect uh, nothing but very clean, sanitized buses going out on the road. That sounds all good. Right. Sounds good. Any, uh, any, any, um, any questions for, for uh, Larry? Larry, I, I have yeah. one question. I saw, sure. I saw something. I, I, I saw something where buses, uh, some some company was dis, uh, sanitizing their buses or disinfecting their buses. With, by using the ultraviolet rays, uh, you know what? I didn't read that. I didn't read the whole article, but have you seen anything about that? I have. Uh, they're they're doing it in New York City on their subways, and it's an interesting service. But I don't really know much about it. Um, have you heard okay. anything about it? No, no. I I, I just read half of the article and stopped, and, and it went. But it yeah. doesn't seem like it's very doesn't seem like a very complicated thing. I'm just wondering. No, I don't right. since, since we don't know how long this this thing is going to go, uh, that might be something we could look at. If it's not too expensive, we might get that and help sanitize it more thoroughly than than fogging and that kind of thing. Right, uh, right. But uh, uh, so I just wanted to ask you that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Nobody else. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Larry. Thank you, sir. Okay, so, John, uh, go ahead. Uh, on page five of your packet, I gave you some supplemental information related to the steps it takes to uh, reopen mass transit during this pandemic, as suggested by the CDC. So that's just for information, so you're aware of, of what we're doing to use this in our consideration to get back to normal service. Um, page six of your packet shows a list of all the routes and the frequency of the enhanced Saturday schedule that we are operating Monday through Friday. So you have a perspective on what service we are providing to the community. And then um, we are talking about uh, reopening, and we're gonna have a discussion about that later on today. Uh, Comet Central, taking into consideration some of the requirements that the governor has placed in relation to public buildings, uh, recognizing that since Common Central has 3,400 square feet, they're suggesting a thousand, uh, five persons per thousand square feet. So that can translate to about 17 people that could be inside Common Central at any given time. So we're going to have some discussions at four o'clock today on how does that look in reopening so we can, in light of the summer heat that's starting to come back, play, we can give our passengers a comforting location to wait inside while they're waiting for connection. Okay. Very good. Any uh any questions for John? John, how how many buses how many buses I I I I could count them, but do you know offhand how many buses we have operating now? I should have probably should have asked Larry that. We are running thirty seven peak buses right now. And uh and, and just a flash. And that's, and that's only fixed route. That does not include paratransit. Okay, thirty-seven. Huh? Now, 37. Uh, a, a flashback. Um, we still maintaining a uh, social distancing on the buses, right? That is correct. Okay. All right. So that's that's why we're, as Larry's reporting, some overcrowding conditions. Because even going to thirty-minute frequency, we're still moving people at half the capacity that we would have carried them pre-COVID-19. So that's something that we're going to have to have a greater discussion on how do we mitigate that because as the ridership come, comes back and we're only going to be transporting at half capacity, it could warrant the need to add additional frequency to routes. And we might get in a situation where we may not have enough buses to do that. So but we're going to have to start getting creative on how are we going to be able to effectively move people, especially on these major corridors during this uh, pandemic that we're in? Yeah, that 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 is a that is a big consideration. Because uh, 
You know, that, that's a big consideration. Let me let me ask you now. We don't right now. Do you think we could cut down? Uh, uh, maybe this is a question later on for you to ask four o'clock or whenever you talk to that group. But just for information, do do you think we can cut down uh, on the uh, social distancing if we require everybody to wear a mask? Uh, I'm, I'm, we're not, we're not, we don't have a mask requirement now, do we? We're not requiring masks since the governor hasn't uh, stated that masks are mandatory. Now, uh, some uh, transit systems across the country are requiring masks, but in those states where they're requiring masks, they are doing it on because the governor has stated so. Um, our neighbors, Carta, I just recently read, they're going back to full service starting next Monday, and they're requiring masks on their vehicles. So I'm curious, mm -hmm. and I'm going to be uh, re communicating to their executive director on what, what, what gave them the comfort to do this in anticipation of not having, or by not having a law in place to warrant it. Um, are they, and are they prepared for any associated risk by making that mandatory? And if they are and their legal counsel is comfortable, then I would like to have a discussion with our legal counsel and with this ad hoc committee on, do we want to go the direction that card is going? Okay. Now, I, now I, I am, is, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Leo. Um, I, I am reading about, in some places, you know, confrontations with um, customers, not just on transit, um, who are adamant about not wearing masks. And um, I don't want us to set up a requirement that we think is essential for safety, like what you're saying, um, Colonel Leakes, about in order to accommodate more people, we'd have to have people, everybody wearing a mask. And and I think, John, in your discussions, you're going to have to weigh um, what is the risk then of having to deal with um, people, um, confrontations with people who are so um, adamant about not wearing masks. And I, I, think, I think that that's the kind of, I mean, what, what we would hope for is that everybody would want to be protective of themselves and others, but we, we don't see that in practice. And so I, I think then what John, the question John is raising is what leverage do we have to enforce that? And, and that's when I think we could, um, would, it would require a law. So, I, or, you know, some authoritative source saying that, um, that, that the masks are required, which I will say also, that doesn't seem to prevent the confrontations. I'm just saying it's the law or that the governor says, you know, um, just just taking into account the the differences among people, there, there are going to be some people who vigorously ob object. So I'm, I'm rambling here, but, but what I don't want us to do, I mean, I, I don't want us to structure a whole strategy for how we keep everybody safe based on the outliers that are going to raise a ruckus no matter what you do. But I think we have to be prepared for how we handle those situations if they arise. And, and you're I exactly right. You. And I'm, I'm very concerned about the possible confrontation that will be posed on our bus operators by them trying to enforce a rule that has not been set as law. So yes, I, I get it. I get it. It leads to some violent situations that would not be favorable for our bus operators. So yes, we definitely need to take that into consideration. I apologize. Mr. Well, let me, just, let, let me just ask you now: if uh, if the governor, uh, if some governmental, like Leo said, authoritative figure, uh, tells us that that's the law, then uh, then that would be basically eliminated. That those persons who didn't want to wear a mask not let them get on there. If they did get on there, then uh, uh, put the policeman on, like, like like when people drive faster than the speed limit, a lot of, you know, you get charged for it. But but we we can cross that when we get to it. But, John, other than other than if, if we can't uh, decrease the social distancing by, um, uh, by wearing a mask or something like that, then how would you, how would we work with the overcrowded buses when we, you know, what, what we would do, we'd try to run the bus every 15 minutes or every 10 minutes or something like that, or what? Yeah, we would have to add more frequency, but what's going to end up happening is 
we're going to run out of buses, so now we're going to have to start looking at service as a whole and service that does, like areas that don't warrant bus service, we may have to um, discontinue in order to meet this demand or temporary suspend until we can get back to some form of a different type of normal. Okay. Or, or we're going to have to lease more buses from another entity, but of course leasing buses would turn into additional operating hours, which turns into additional costs, which as you'll be discussing um, in, in the budget, where we're, we're getting tight on revenue because of the sales tax being down. Exactly. I so, so we have to be very strategic on service delivery and making sure we're putting the service where the demand warrants it if we're going to continue with the social Mr. distancing Mr. practices. Mr. Chair. Okay. Yes, sir. Derek? Okay. Um, well, I've stressed several times that when, you, when we start to open and building back to capacity, that we get the intel from the drivers. So they can tell us basically who's on the bus and when we will probably be at capacity issues. So please um, make sure they're part of this process so we can ramp up as we need to. Uh, to make sure we got service where the the higher levels of service are needed as opposed to the lower service of need. So if you would, just, just make sure that they're part of the process. Yes, and I can assure you that uh, TransDev is definitely getting feedback from them and their supervisors for this. And can you confirm that, Larry, if you don't mind? Uh, yes, John. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Somebody was in my office talking to me. Um, what, what, what was that feedback about? You're getting feedback from the bus operators as we and supervisors as we make operational decisions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Daily. Um, in addition to these, you know, the operators pulling in full buses, you know, getting constant feedback all day long about uh, conditions on the buses, overcrowding, and um, uh, you know, just, just what's going out on going on on the road. But we're getting uh, constant feedback from the drivers and the supervisors. L Larry, Larry, have we had any uh, <clears throat> any discussion or problems with people being combative and wanting to fight about anything uh, it on the happens, buses? But it, huh? it's not uh, it's not happening often, but it does happen. And um, uh, we've we've had a couple of incidences in the last few weeks. Um, Fortunately, no. You know, one person uh, was assaulted, but it was it was very minor. Um, what I mean in terms of that, nobody got hurt, but it was it was a um, it was a verbal altercation that escalated. And, and but the other instances were just they they were just that they were verbal altercations when emotions were getting high on the bus, and uh, each one of those operators has been dealt with. Um, you know, accordingly, you know, if, if, if there was something that they could have done better, they were, they were coached on those, in those instances. Okay. So, well, so Larry, uh, were these, were these, um, were these d disagreements among riders or between the, um, the rider and the driver? Both. Both. Both? Okay. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Larry, one, one, yes, sir. one, I saw. I saw a photo of a lady on, in the newspaper on somewhere that was uh, had had assaulted one of our drivers, and the, and the person was on the run. Did they ever catch her? Or do you did you hear anything else about I, that? To my knowledge, they never caught her. Never caught her. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Any other questions or comments on on that uh, portion there about reopening and and uh, how we're going to take care of this, this this situation? Any other points? Questions? Okay. If not, then that's a good good report on item number four A. Uh, so let's go ahead to item four B. Uh, COVID COVID nineteen testing. Pages yes, I will ask um, Leroy the chance to speak on this. Okay. okay on uh, the comment COVID nineteen testing process, uh, page seven through uh, uh, ten. Uh, First of all, if you notice, I uh, gave some proposed uh, testing dates. Uh, 
and the hours are 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. <clears throat> and basically the 2 p.m. is so that uh, Lovelace Family Medical, uh, with the testing that they do that day, they can get it to the lab and try to turn it around within uh, 24 hours. Sometimes it may take uh, 48 hours, but most of the time they can get the results back in 24 hours. Also, too, I propose two dates just in case. Uh, it it kind of gives uh, all the employees a little bit of flexibility as, as far as trying to get that number of employees through uh, one day. But also, too, if we run into some issues with results or with scheduling and things like that, it gives us a little time to react. Uh, for example, if uh, we had someone that tested positive, then we've got to make sure that as far as scheduling is concerned, we can cover uh, uh, those individuals. So, you know, worst case scenario, if it was multiple ones, then it gives us a little bit of flexibility uh, to uh, get with the individuals that are furloughed and uh, get them in. And when we do that, they're required a certain number of hours of training. So that gives us a little bit of flexibility there in having uh, uh, two uh, testing dates. Uh, also, too, as far as the testing, uh, COVID-19 uh, testing there, I've just kind of listed, and these are things that are, w was mentioned last week uh, about uh, making sure that the employees, uh, when they come, they bring the insurance uh, card. Uh, Lovelace will have all the documentations that they would need uh, to, to uh, sign. Also, there's a uh, consent form as for us as the employer to, to get those uh, get those results. Uh, next on the uh, positive lab results, uh, Lovelace uh, Family Medical, they will be responsible for reporting positive results uh, to DHEC, just positive results. The, the lab that they use, PATH Group, they're responsible for reporting all. So they will report the positive and the, and the negative uh, results to DHEC, so they'll have all of uh, that data. Uh, and uh, I know last week uh, I didn't uh, distinguish with you, but in talking again with Lovelace, they explained uh, what happens there. Uh, also, too, any uh, positive results that that individual, that employee, will go immediately into 14-day uh, quarantine. And before they could come back to work uh, here, they would have to uh, provide uh, Relief, relief from their, their physician. Also, too, if that person uh, is quarantined for those 14 days, Lovelace Pharmacy through their, or uh, Family Medicine through their telehealth process, they will stay in touch with that person every three days. Also, too, the importance of having them report to DHEC is, the positive results is if you have someone that uh, tested positive, with the information that they filled out before the testing, that information is crucial. So if they, if the information is reported to DHEC, then DHEC is going to follow up with that individual that employee within one to two days. They'll be questioning them about uh, contact tracing. Uh, so they will basically take over from there as far as what needs to be done, is there, who do they need to contact and follow up with? So that's very key that we have the correct information from the employee just in case uh, they test positive and that information gets to DHEC. So DHEC can get, go into action and do the things that, that they need to do. Also too, uh, from an employer standpoint, we would want to know that employee standpoint of who they feel you may have been in contact with uh, here at work. Even though those individuals may be contacted by DHEC, but I think from an employer responsibility, uh, we need to do that also. One thing we need to remember, if we're doing testing, and say, for example, we do have uh, an employee that tests positive, uh, what we have to remember is since we're testing our employees, they may have been in close contact with other employees, but if those employees go through the screening and they've been tested also, then that sort of that's a safeguard for us. 
because mm -hmm. if that person has a uh, negative, we should be okay. Again, we don't want to ignore that or not address that with the employer or employees. We still want to make sure everything is okay there and, and not only them monitor themselves, but, but we monitor uh, them also. So I think that's a key point that we need to uh, keep in mind as we, we uh, uh, test uh, employees is, you know, again, like I said, uh, you could have one, but maybe they felt like they've been in close proximity with three or four others. But if we had them tested also and they're positive, you know, that's a good sign. But, you know, it's still not something that you, that needs to be ignored, but that will that will be a safeguard that we have to, uh, that we can utilize. I, and, I think you're making a really good point because that's, that kind of um, testing 100% of uh, our employee population, our driver population, it is, is, a, is a key feature there because it means that we are following up on any employee contacts through that initial process. Um, I, did have a, I, I did have a question because I think, I mean, you've outlined, and this is, looks like a really excellent plan for me for, the, for our baseline, getting our baseline testing. So let me, let's walk down the road a little bit. So following this overall testing and the, and the appropriate follow-up for that, then would we simply be um, identifying any employee who um, exhibits symptoms and retesting at that point, following up on those? Is that, how, is that how the system would work after this initial testing? If we needed to do follow-up? If, if we, I mean, pass this initial testing, mm -hmm. then we're not, not planning to do any other broad-based testing. We're just looking at to follow up if any employee starts having symptoms. Is that what? Right, right. Uh, and, and I think one good thing, um, uh, Ms. Mood, is I, I think with the, the establishing the working relationship with Lovelace Family Medical. And, yes. And the, I think the easy process that I've had with them and how they've shared information and they've done, uh, for example, when it's hard to get in touch with DHEC, you know, they can and, and talk things through. I think if we run into that or we see, then I think that's something that we can coordinate with them. I but think that's a great, I, I think that's a great plan because, that, because to have somebody that you already have the working relationship with that you can call and say, this is what's come up and what do you advise here? I think that's, that's wonderful to have that access to that medical system. Yes, and I think that's kind of, you know, uh, going through this and, and looking at my background, what I'm responsible for, it makes the world of a difference to me to have the expert, the, the people that know and work with this in so many different ways, uh, to, to have them to kind of guide you and, and give you uh, direction and information uh, to make this process as, as smoothly as possible. And, That's and right. We, we, want, we want as little guesswork as we can have. Exactly. Right. I'm not the medical professional. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. And, and Lil, I think one thing I'll mention on that, that's also what started me and us as, as a staff thinking of, okay, when we do this, we still have to look at other safeguards that we can put in place. And that's when we, came, when we uh, started looking at, say, for example, that's why I added the future workplace safety proposal the, the mm -hmm. training uh, kiosk and started looking at that because I think once we get through this initial phase, uh, not only the, uh, the, the PPEs and practicing all the, the social distancing and all, but what else can we do here uh, from an employer to an employee standpoint or even visitors that enter our building uh, to mm -hmm. make sure that, you know, they're healthy, feeling well, there's not a fever, those type of things. And that's why I add that to the end of uh, the information that I gave you, and uh, we've uh, been doing some research on the temperature screening kiosk, and I gave you two uh, manufacturers uh, that will be that we've actually considered, uh, and, and give you that information also because I think that's a to me that's a big part too as we go on and not l knowing how long this will last. I just think it'll be a part of our lives in some way, some way. Well, I'm I'm glad to see you doing that forward thinking and seeing how because it's so important to catch things early. I mean, that's part of the key to 
disrupting the spread is to catch it early. And and what I'm thinking about is that, you know, by the fall, we're also going to be dealing with the um, onset of the regular flu system. Mm-hmm. Well, um, um, the season, flu season, where you are going to get some of the same kind of um, symptoms uh, arising. So if we have a have a have a, an early detection system and then have a way of screening out. I mean, that makes sense to me, even for um, um, exposure of of other workers and passengers to other co- communicable diseases that may look like COVID, even if they're not. Yeah, it, yeah. To me, when you do, I, to me, looking at this. Uh, you know where we are, where we're going, what we're going to have to do with it. It becomes basically a wellness plan or a wellness exactly. program because exactly any, whether it's, it's COVID nineteen or whether it's whatever flu uh, that we'll have to deal with in the fall, uh, it, it it benefits the employee and the employer. It benefits everyone to have you know everyone as healthy as possible. And uh, right I think, again, one of the first. Uh, key that you look at is uh, is is there a fever because you know there are certain things going on with the body there, but it also I think it makes it you know it makes it a better workplace a better work environment it puts us in the opportunity it puts us in a situation to serve our customers our riders better because I think again you have a, a healthier staff they feel that the employer cares about them and the environment that they're in so I think everybody benefits from from that and and I, I I don't think I've met anybody that didn't enjoy being healthy. <laughs> well, and and I think I think the concept of looking at this as a part of overall employee wellness is a great way to approach it because what we what we're not doing is I mean what we'd be doing is setting up a system that just doesn't just revolve around a crisis situation, but is a as a way that we. Um, Act at all times to keep our employees healthy. I think you're right on the right track. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And um, okay. Colonel Leach, you had a question. No, no, no go, go, go ahead. I, no, I, I, I was going to say uh, also too. You know, I put in there, like I said, about the two uh, temperature screening. Uh, one uh, company is local. Uh, myself and Tanisha actually had the opportunity to go out and they did a demo uh, as far as how th- how that particular uh, kiosk works and it's something that uh, we want to uh, pursue and uh, you know from a com- uh, committee uh, standpoint uh, you know we would look for your uh, your direction approval as far as us continuing to to do this and we've got additional information uh, that we can share on, on this but we wanted to get this in the packet to, to, to let you know what we were considering. Well, Mr. Me, Chairman, could I ask what what are we talking about in terms of ballpark cost for that either of these? Okay, uh, on the first one, the ID wholesaler, uh, it's about thirty three hundred dollars. Uh, on the instant cam, that's through a local uh, company here, uh, Colite. Uh, the Actual uh, instance cam is, uh, I think it's twenty nine fifty, and there's like six hundred dollars for the stand that it goes on, and it's pretty sturdy, durable. It kind of gives us the opportunity also to, to kind of brand it, uh, uh, you know, with the comet. And they also, one thing we liked about the demo that they that they gave us, they also have uh, stickers and decals that we can put on the floor, you know, to tell an individual stand here or we can put it down to show them as far as social distancing the six feet mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so that's basically the, the the cost to me they're they're pretty similar one thing mm-hmm. uh, in in seeing the demo through uh, colite here is um, it has additional features that we can add uh, to the to the system and if we Go that route. I think it's an extra twenty-five dollars per month. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, they they have uh, customer support, IT support. Uh, we did ask them that if we went that route and say if we decided on Colite, uh, we we asked them for a uh, sort of like a test period 
and they said probably the most that they could do would be a day or day or two where they could come out and you know present it to to, uh, to do a demo. Well, so so those the, those numbers that you're quoting is that a, a, a an investment in the purchase of the of the of the equipment or is that a monthly charge? Well, that's that's the purchase. Yeah. Purchase. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So and, the other uh, features would be the monthly charge. Okay. Uh, yes, in talking with uh, Colite this, this morning, and uh, uh, it's it's just different things that uh, we can uh, do with the system as we go forward from uh, uh, giving us certain certain type of information. Uh, you know, there is heavens. Wi-Fi uh, capabilities, things like, like that. Is now exiting. And and what about what about um, is there some kind of maintenance contract? Uh, not Tanisha. I don't know whether uh, he didn't say anything about a maintenance contract. You know, we have access to their IT, and they will have uh, to ours. Uh, they say they tend to probably upgrade. You know, maybe the software every so often, but uh, there's not a lot of maintenance uh, that they okay. see. But it just. Okay. Uh, gives us the the availability to uh, utilize it. You know, it could get to a point where it could all it could be used for time in attendance for different uh, security type things, uh, facial recognition, uh, just mm -hmm, mm -hmm. different things. Okay, well, I appreciate that the, the staff exploring that, and we'll just hear from you later on that. Is that that goes? Okay. Let me let me ask you two quick questions. One for John and and, and one for you, uh, Leroy. Uh, the I see where you said employees uh, should present their insurance cards and and, and other information uh, to family practice. Now, will they will they will they will they be paying charging the insurance company as well as us? Or will, will, I'm just kind of uh, is that most of our identification purpose? Yes. Yeah. Remember their. Um what we discussed last week, there is a with theirs is fifty dollars per person, and that covers the administration. Because remember, they're basically looking at our size. Uh, they would have a physician here, uh, a nurse practitioner, a nurse, and maybe one to two uh, administrative people to handle right. just the paperwork. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what the fifty dollars uh, would cover uh, per. Uh, Per person or employee, and then well, then then the, then the, the what what would the insurance company pay? The insurance company would pay the fifty dollars, or would we have to pay it? No, that's what I'm we trying would to pay that. We'd have to pay the fifty dollars. So. You're talking about the insurance would pay for the test itself, the test and if they stopped. don't have insurance, then the feds. I mean, that gets covered by federal law. Is that is that right? Is that what I read? Uh -huh. Yes. Uh huh. What 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 I'm asking? We out of our out of the money we got, uh, the 15 mil we got, we agreed that we'd pay X number of dollars uh, for all the employees to be tested and everything. Right. What I'm trying to figure out is that would that cover everything, or would this insurance pay addition to that? I, I, what I don't, I don't want to pay people twice. You know, I'm stingy. I don't want to, I don't want to pay them twice, and I want to make sure that that's not a part of the, the plan. But uh, but I'm sure you'll work that out, and you you well, know you know about that too. Like I said, um, and and when uh, it was included in that budget, there was the fifty dollar cost for the administration portion of the testing. Okay. And then you have the, the 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 screening itself, which would be billed to the insurance company for them to cover that. Oh, so so okay, so the fifty dollar. All right, I didn't understand it last week, but that's okay. Sounds good. Uh, any other? I had one other question I forgot who it was, but uh, you had a question okay. for me, uh, Mr. Lisa. I think you wanted to oh, ask I, me. Mine, mine was mostly about the uh, the funds, but uh, Leroy knew he he got it just right. I was oh, just wondering good. whether the same thing about the funds here. Uh, okay, any other questions or comments? So if I just well, may ask, um, Leroy, so our next actionable items are? Do you mind just highlighting that? Well, our next actionable item would be, uh, as far as the proposed testing date, do we want to go ahead and contact them about doing testing on these particular dates? Okay. 
what, do you need a do you need a um, recommendation or a motion from us? Because I would just leave that to the staff to um, arrange. That's what I was about but to, to, hey, to, hey, to hey. With our I, approval to just go ahead and proceed. Okay. Um, I, if, I if, if you feel comfortable, um, we'll we'll take the just so that the board is comfortable. Um, we we budgeted the funds in the CARES Act budget that the board approved last uh, earlier this week, so we're just implementing those actions. Right, right. That's how I see okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, we we don't we just want to make sure we endorse that. That's it. That sounds good to me. Go ahead and and take care of it and do it. And that's your day to day stuff, John. And we'll go from there. Any other comments or questions about it? We don't need a vote on this, do we? Um, you don't need to. But if it, if it gives you comfort, we'll we'll accept your vote. <laughs> Okay, give me a motion, Lil. You, you frame, well, you well I, I'm, I move that we uh, approve the staff's proceeding with the um, process of testing as outlined. <laughs> okay. Uh, can I get a second? That might be you. Yeah, uh, okay, I'm to drop off. Oh, he did? Okay, I'll check it out. Okay, then. Uh, 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 all in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. All right. Okay. So that's your that's your the direction. Go ahead and and go with that. Any other uh, comments, uh, questions about anything before we uh, before we conclude this meeting today? So on pages 16 through 20 of your packet, I just gave you some supplemental information on what transit workers need to know about COVID-19. It's guidance on how they can protect themselves and how they can. Um, and what steps an employer should take. And they also do the same for the transit maintenance worker. So it's just uh, information for you, uh, transdev, our staff, and the public, if they're interested to understand, well, what is important to keep our workers safe uh, while we're they're going through this pandemic? Okay. I appreciate having that good information. I do, and, may, and making it available. All right. What we'll that looks good. Okay. All right, then. Is is that it? That's it, John? That's all we have for this week's uh, meeting, sir. All I right, move that we adjourn. I second. <laughs> all in favor? Make it be known by the meeting. Have a nice day. Okay. Thank you, guys. Meeting adjourned. Okay. Thank you much. Enjoy right. it. Have a good one. Multiple right. people right. are now exiting. Lil Mood is now exiting. All right. Rothman is now exiting. Leroy DeChant is now exiting. Unknown participant is now exiting.